another episode of Into the West podcast. My name is Charles. With me today are Richard, Ian, and we have a special guest, Don. Don is also a fellow Canadian. He is from uh, Ontario, Canada, and he is part of their league, their OSBGL, as well as one of the hosts of North of the Shire podcast. And Don is joining us today to rank all the profiles in Isengard. Yeah, Thanks for having me on, guys. Really appreciate it. Big fan of the show. Happy to be here. For viewers who don't know, Don also has a, a podcast. Um, Don, can you talk a little bit about um, North of the Shire podcast for those who are not familiar with it, what, what it's about, and what do you guys uh, discuss and talk over on that show? So it's primarily myself and Andrew Brock. And so there's me, who's like an old guy um, and not competitive. So I'm into the hobby side. I'm into the social side of things. That's why I love to play the game. But I'm in it for the lols, not for the trophies. Andrew, on the other hand, is like he's an accountant. So he's got like an incredibly good memory for the rules, the armies. He knows everything. He's won our league two or three times. Very competitive, very good at the game. So we sort of approach it from two different sides, I guess. We do have another couple of friends who occasionally come on. Chris, who's like a really incredibly good painter. And Garrett, who uh, both of these guys are friends of ours. And Garrett's like really experienced in a lot of different game systems by Games Workshop and, and other companies. Essentially, our podcast is more of a chatty one. So like... Uh, we do a lot of uh, like, you know, what have you been working on? That kind of stuff. We do cover tournaments that we do analysis, uh, like we've been doing analysis of missions. But we do other stuff, too. We talk sometimes about things that aren't MESBG related, that are just Lord of the Rings things that are happening in the world. I like to be very creative. And, and so because with podcasts and YouTube, you guys know, you know, when you think of a good idea, it's like, oh, crap, somebody else has already done that. So you're going to bump into people occasionally. So like one of the things I'd like to do is I like to write things and create things. So, you know, I, I like to present that kind of stuff on the podcast because there's literally no risk of having anybody else having done the same thing because it's it's a unique thing. So anyway, we're kind of all over the place on our podcast, but mainly it's just a couple of friends getting together talking about play an MESBG at the end of the day. I, uh, I feel called out that we're not as creative. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? It's like you guys are doing battle reports. And I think that's probably the most common sort of creative thing people can do on, on YouTube and your stuff that you've put out. Uh, like I say, like I, I rank your guys battle reports, like right up at the top uh, of the stuff that you see on, on YouTube. You guys have done an incredible job. Yeah. Thanks Don. Yeah. Definitely takes a while, but yeah, just um, going back to the North of the Shire podcast, I definitely recommend it to you, all the viewers to go check it out. It's audio only, but it's, it's great. Um, like you said that you guys cover everything. So for all the hobby lovers and, you know, for myself as a more competitive player, you guys have a good amount of tactics too. Like one of my favorite series is when you discuss the different types of armies. That's always mm -hmm. been really interesting to me. Like, you know, you guys have like the Horde army, the uh, the big heroes. And then, yeah, you guys have the different names for them. But yeah, yeah. it's it's great. So today uh, we're talking about Isengard. We're going to be ranking all the profiles. And you've told us previously that this is one of your favorite armies to play what would you say is the reason for one of your favorites probably because it's the first one that i had painted to be honest um way back in i think it was 2002 uh back when games workshop actually lived in canada before the united states has had really caught on to games workshop we used to have games days here in toronto and uh we ran Garrett, Andrew, and myself ran a demo back then. I think it was 2002, maybe 2003, for Lord of the Rings. And they gave us two armies, a Rohan army and an Urukai army. And I ended up keeping the Urukai army. And, you know, we painted enough models to use it then. And then it sat in my basement. One year, I just brought it to the cottage and I painted the entire thing. This was when nobody around here was playing it. One day uh, in 2014, Adam from Blackfire Productions 
asked me if I wanted a game. And I'm like, yeah, I have a whole army for, for this game. And so I played a game with him and never looked back. I've just been playing the game ever since. It's been my number one game since that day. I've always had that army. You know, you guys picked it as one of your beginner armies. But this is a huge army. And like with the new units that have come out recently with Dunlin been added to the unit, this is one of the bigger armies in the game. There's a lot of choices. There's tons of different ways you can play this army. Like I think this army has upwards now of like 30 unique units in it, um, which is massive. Like, you know, some armies have like six or, you know, so there's you can play Isengard non-stop basically and enjoy it but you know occasionally i like to play my dwarves too so they have to take a back seat sometimes but yeah i think diversity of the army is good i've got a lot of experience with the game i already mentioned earlier i'm not the most competitive guy but this is a reliable army to play too so you know you're using urukai uh you're probably going to win at least one game in a tournament so that's what i like yeah and you, and you were telling us offline too that you've had over 100 Isengard tournament games so I think you're the you're the right guy to talk to <laughs> maybe the at the most I would say I, I would say 100 tournament games yeah I wouldn't be surprised if I'm pushing 100 and I guess it's not the greatest uh, advertisement for the army when I say I've never won a tournament so there you go <laughs> I'm sure 100, you, ga 100 games and never a winner <laughs> I, I'm sure you podiumed a couple times oh yeah too well, humbled on <laughs> Lots of podiums, you know, I've, I've, I think I've gone four and oh in tournaments three times and not one. <laughs> see, see, just don't say you never won. Just say you podium a bunch of times. <laughs> yeah, lots of podiums on there. I like that. I like that. <laughs> yeah, You're definitely right there. There's uh, so many ways to play this army because it's so fleshed out. And having played it myself, it's, it's a really beginner friendly army because they can do a lot of things yeah. decently well. So... That's totally understandable, and I'm sure I, it, at some point it was one of my favorite armies too. Well, Andrew from from our podcast likes to say that you know they have the holy trinity, right? Fight four, strength four, defense six. So when you're starting out with that for ten points, it's like that's pretty solid. I just want to mention the sponsor for this video, Baron of Dice. They make nice looking dice for a wide range of games including Middle Earth SVG. You can use our promo code WEST for 5% off. Go check out their dice on the website. And I also want to say a quick thank you to our patrons over on Patreon. Thank you for supporting us. And if you're interested in extra content and seeing videos early and other perks, please go check it out in the link below. Let's uh, jump into the tier list. Just to catch viewers up, we have a video called the Evil Men tier list that we did with Rainier earlier last year um, please go check it out where we ranked all the profiles that have the man keyword in them so uh, what we're going to do is i'm going to put them all in the tiers that we assigned them to in that tier list so for for detailed analysis and breakdown of those profiles please go watch that video and we'll just briefly go over them to see if our opinions have changed to see if don has anything to add and um We'll go from there uh, before we dive into uh, the Isengard profiles that we have yet to cover. Yeah, so. Don, feel free to tell us how wrong we are about these ratings. All Don't right. hold back. You got one wrong already, I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fairly okay with this current ranking. Maybe I would put, like, Frida ahead of the Oathmaker, but, and then maybe, like, I don't know, the War Chief. I mean, I guess it's okay at the bottom of Fortitude. So yeah, I think for the most part, I'm I'm still okay with this. Yeah, I remember we struggled a little bit to put Thryden and Valor, but uh, I think uh, Rainier in that video swung the vote. I, th and I think I feel like you Thryden. guys you guys struggled to put him up there. I I, I love him. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's, he's definitely mounted. solid. He's definitely solid. Yeah, he's he's uh, strength five. He's mounted so. You know, he's he's definitely got stuff going for him. Like he has more heroic stats than than most Urukai heroes have. So he's got that going for him. And he's got Lord of Dunlin, so 12 inch uh standfast. He's got that going for him. So there's like one of the builds you can do with this army is you can do like an orc horde or you can do like a wildman horde. And then you've got three leaders or three heroes here 
that can really help your courage. And he's one of them. So like 12 inch stand fast for an army like that is big. Um, so I, I think he's correctly placed in valor. Okay. I don't think Gorolf is correctly placed in valor. He should be legend. He's an auto take. He, he's as close as you can get to an auto take in this army. Now, um, if you're not taking him in your Isengard army, you're, you're doing something wrong. Like, he, he's he should be in every Isengard army. He's that good. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good argument. Um, I think that he's definitely close for me. Um, I wouldn't be opposed to shifting him up, I guess, um, in the scope of like comparison to other profiles as well mm -hmm. in other lists. Like, yeah, um, like not just in Isengard, then um, I think like if he was a hero of valor himself right um that would probably swing it for me but just because probably because just being a hero of fortitude mm -hmm. has some limitations on alliances and also leading the warriors um yeah absolutely that's a good point the fortitude does possibly drag him down um i think the reason why i like him so much is is um basically the hole that he plugs in your army so you know, this army is vulnerable to cavalry. It's also vulnerable to big heroes because they don't have one of their own, right? And Gorolf can deal with a big hero. So um, numerous games I've like just shut down like a, you know, a 150 point hero with Gorolf for like five turns in a row. Um, and, you know, he, he wins you the game just because of that one thing. Um, so he, he's big for me. I think at the very least he should be at the top of Valor. I mean, there's only two there right now, but uh, I could live with him being at the top of Valor. He, what do you think, boys? The... Do we, do we shift him to legend? Uh, I, I mean, so he's 70 points and like the fight five with three attacks for like only 70 points. That's pretty cheap. Like. What else is and cheaper than three attacks? Like Hunter or Captains? Five. Like, is there anything else? Yeah. He's a good heroic defense hero, but he's also in the position where he can, like, threaten enemy heroes if he wins the fight. So it's not like they just want to let him win, which is really good. Like, it's rare to get, like, both of those things where it's, like, they're a credible threat, even when they call heroic defense. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's good. Yeah, in your list, you also have Ma Maher. I know he doesn't have strike, but he's also around the same points for, for three attack, fight five. Well, that's um, true. I think um, Gorolf is really, really good, and he's an auto-take in the Legion. But in an overall Isengard army, I don't know if he would be an auto-pick for me. I think that Heroic Defense is really good against heroes, but there are some things that it doesn't protect him from. So, for example, like Magic, you know, he has one will, which for a cheap hero, that's fine. Um, he's not going to be targeted all the time but he only has one will and against shooting heroic defense doesn't really protect him either you hit the nail on the head there with his two weaknesses he often can die from shooting if you have a knowledgeable opponent and also like most heroes in this list only one will and one fate yeah. so yeah when you look at him in the larger world of mesbg yeah maybe valor is correct because right now the meta in general, involves a lot of fight five troops, which are pretty good countered him, considering he is only D5 with two wounds, and he doesn't get the heroic defense against troops, it's only against heroes. So, if he loses a fight against those kind of troops, which can happen you know, pretty pretty easily, then he's, he's in a lot of trouble. Mm -hmm. Valor's probably a good spot for him. Why do you have Frida below the Oath, Oath Maker? Just curious. We found that typically especially when you're playing the Legion. She's a good profile, but she's overshadowed by Gorolf. The Oathmaker is a cheap might battery, especially Rainier, who's had in, uh, experience with this Legion, said that he found himself taking Oathmaker a lot more often than Frida because Frida kind of does what Gorolf does, which is hold down against big heroes, but Gorolf is just better. So a little bit redundant. All right, so jumping into the rest of the Isengard profiles, to start, we have Saruman the White. You're going for the most controversial one right off the top. <laughs> <laughs> he should be the most awesome guy in this army, but he's not, unfortunately. I don't rank him highly at all. In fact, we just talked about him in our latest podcast episode, and I believe Andrew used the phrase, 
sucks. <laughs> wow. Ooh, I, I, I think that that's a bit con- controversial. I don't yeah. think it's that bad for for me. Well, <laughs> I mean, he's a wizard. He's expensive. He brings a lot of stats to the party. He can do a yeah. lot. There's no no question about that. It's whether he's worth 180 points in in an army where you can buy a really good mid tier hero and 12 really good warriors for 180 points. But well, I, that's like I think the biggest issue right there is that because he's so expensive and your base troops are costing like you know 10 11 points if you're gonna go the uh the urukai route which you want to because it's a very solid profile then you your army fills up very fast and I don't think it, you ever get quite like to the numbers that you want to whenever you're yeah. trying to run Saruman yeah there's, there's yeah. probably a points value or two where he works at quite well but I'm, I'm not sure where that where that is with Isengard to be honest I think I, I see a lot of newer players struggle when they bring him because of the reasons you guys have said. Also, uh, for a wizard that's so many points, it's it's hard for a, a newer player or an unexperienced player to get the most out of it. So I, I agree that it's not an easy profile to use, but I do think that in the hands of a experienced player, he can be very, very good. And he also gives you access to Grima. That's probably the main thing that brings his stock up um but it it comes down to the point where are you looking at saruman and grima as two completely separate profiles or are you looking at them kind of as a single profile where grima is kind of an option for saruman um so it kind of changes the game a little bit um because like i would love to take grima in every game but like i i won't take saruman if i'm trying to win yeah, no, that's that's fair. Um, I think we joked about Grima being kind of like a war gear for for Saruman, you know? Yeah. Like he's he's like a much better like Orcrist option, you know. Like like I like what they tried to do with Saruman. I just I don't think it really worked out in the end. So, you know, they, they've changed his profile from the good Saruman, um, and they've removed like uh, a really incredibly good rule for him. Uh, is it Lord of the Astari? Uh, no, so... it's, it, I think they both have Lord of the Astari. It's um, he doesn't have Aura of Command. Aura of Command, yeah. Okay. Um, I just think like the Palantir that they've given him in in this one, like he should be a, he should be a general that is going to buff a rank and file army, and the stuff that he has just doesn't do that, right? Even you know, like even the Palantir, um, good idea. You know, you seize priority, but it's often just countered by a heroic move. Um, so like in the end, it, it like rarely really does anything in the game. And like he's missing, he's missing some key spells, or like even if he counted as a banner, or you know, if he had blinding light or like aura of command. Like all of those things would raise his stock, right? But he, like because he's supporting a rank and file army, but just the lack of all of that stuff, like other than just trying to shut down a, an enemy hero, um, you know, with immobilize, you're going to have a hard time even coming close to making back 180 points with this guy. Those are all really fair points. And he's definitely not as good as the good Saruman I agree that he definitely should have aura of command I think that would that would make him very very playable and I, I still do think he's playable now not as bad as what you and Andrew think uh, I think he has his place he definitely it's hard to build the regular Urukai horde with him I think you yeah. either go orcs with him to keep things yeah. a bit cheaper or you could kind of take him as an ally with like a Crabane or two and then you you get that really strong magic because I yep. would say that he is better than your regular like transfix ring wraith and that he has that 18 inch compel and that is probably a spell that could win you some games. So he's not like an auto pick by any means, but it's hard for me to not put him at least in fortitude, you know, like it, he's definitely very playable for me. I think you made a good point. We know him as being like the the leader of the Urukai from the movie. But I, I think the army build that he best fits into is if you're trying to spam out an orc horde, he fits a lot better in that army. A, because you can afford him, and B, what he does actually complements the orc horde more than it would an Urukai army. 
I think I would put him in the top of Fortitude. I think he's he's a bit more flexible than the Oathmaker, even if he's not <clears throat> as much value, because you really only see the Oathmaker when you're going to spam out the, the Wildman, and it's more niche. But I'm so, good with having him that in this spot, actually. I, I think, at least to Fortitude, I think part of the reason I like Thryden so much is that he... He's like the only thing in this list that combos really, really well with Saruman because of that 18 inch compel and because Thryden has the the mighty blow and he's mounted. Like he can put out the damage to like maximize the effectiveness of that command. It's a juicy combo. But yeah, it just like we said earlier, it comes down to like being able to list build with him is incredibly hard to get the right balance of troops uh, and, and heroes. Most of the time you're going to end up with him and maybe two other heroes and possibly Grima. And then you just got to try and maximize your numbers, but it's tricky. There is an argument to put him in at the maybe lower end of Valor, but because of the list he's in and the options available in Isengard, uh, I'm I'm okay with top of Fortitude. I think it's it's he hovers somewhere in that area. Agreed. He might be better if you could combine him with another spellcaster with, with the immobilized kind of thing and i have seen people do that build with like the witch king allied in but then that gets that gets a little crazy and soupy so you know it's interesting all right so next we have lurts oh here we go we're gonna go uh for a little bit of a tussle on lurts i think because i know charles isn't a fan <laughs> I've done an episode on him before, and uh, I remember Don messaging me afterwards telling me <laughs> what he thought of my opinion. <laughs> hey, yeah. look, you know what? I'll be the first to admit that, like, Lurts isn't a top-tier hero. There's no question about it, right? But you take what you can get with this army, and he's pretty much, if not the best, he's right up there amongst the best you can get in this army. He brings a lot with three attacks and three wounds, three might strike. Uh, yes, he only has uh, one will and one fate, which is very common in this army. So that's that's a definite shot against him. He's got defense six, which most of the other archives don't have. He has a funky special rule, which usually you can be guaranteed that'll kick into play in one of your games and find the halflings so you can choose where you come on in any maelstrom or reinforcement mission and i think there's four of those out of the 18. so like if like us i don't know if you guys out there are playing with veto now like it's really popular here right now so with veto you can pretty much guarantee you're going to get one game out of let's say a four game tournament where that's going to come into play. So it does help. So, you know, I rate this guy fairly highly. He's in every Arakai army I ever play with because I don't play with Saruman. Um, anyway, I, I won't say where I'll put him. Though. Let, let, let's hear what you guys have to say. Uh, I've said it before and I'll say it again. I still really like this profile. He is a little expensive at 90 points, but just like the base profile is really good. The one will, one fate isn't the greatest, but, you know, he's only 90 points. And he's got some good actions that you want, and that find the halflings rule is always great. So, yeah, I, 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 I'd put him at least in a valor. I think he, he was definitely like, I guess, better by default before the Dunlin release because he was like, you know, the hitter that you kind of wanted or needed in the Isengard Legion. But then now that you have like Gorolf, you can kind of see how he's taken a lot less. Because, yeah, like his weaknesses, he's he's probably not the best leader once you start going over like 600 points. He's okay as your secondary hero, but that's more because you're lacking like the options in Isengard, you know, for like a, a hitter. He's decent in Isengard, like Valor level. But if you consider like, if you drop him in like, let's say a Mordor or, you know, like a Serpent Horde, like. How how often would you be taking him, really? Yeah, it's a good point. He got some buffs now um, since Quest of the Ring Bearer, so he has, like, the shield throw, the hero challenge, and, and the <laughs> help him a little bit in the Legion. And you can argue that in a standard Isengard army, he's the only Valor and above choice. You know, I think that Thryden should be Hero Valor, but at the moment, he's the only Hero Valor in... Isengard. So if you're not taking Saruman, the only way to ally in Isengard is 
with Lurts. And maybe that's the reason why we don't see very many yellow lists with Isengard, because he's not like the uh, amazing option that you will want. As we'll get into it, there are some really good profiles in this army. And so for 90 point hero to ally in, he just doesn't, to me, he doesn't bring enough. Being the only hero valor in the list gives him a few points because if you do want to ally, that's the only way to do it. At the same time, you're not getting amazing value for 90 points. So yeah, I agree. Um, I th- I don't I don't think you can sort of undersell his vulnerabilities because certainly he can die in one turn to a big hero charging on a on a mount. So mm-hmm. that's the reality of the situation. But he is like I like him because I I like this type of hero and he's utility. So like he comes with a shield and his defense six, so he can shield when he needs to, and he also has a bow, right? So. You know, you seldom get stuck in, in like having a turn where you can do absolutely nothing with him because like if you have nothing else to do, you can you can still fire an arrow with your shoot three plus uh, with a with a strength three bow. So these are small things, but like they're things that may may not make him a more competitive model, but they make him a more enjoyable model to play with. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I'll also say that Charles, you brought up a good point that I think because he has his legion and you know, we got a lot of flack for it in our uh, ring bears and necromancer tier list, but we still like the Legion, even if the general um, population in Middle Earth um, seem to really think we're wrong about that. So I think because of that, um, it raises the stock um, a little bit for me, and I would. Put him above Saruman and below Thryden, but whether he's in Valor or Fortitude, I'll leave it up to you guys. I'm fighting for that Valor spot. I'm with you, Ian. Maybe maybe it's because I, I just play Elves too much and they have very expensive three attack heroes, but like 90 points for like that like profile, I, I really like it. Especially just like the march and strike, like Don's like the utility is great. And then also like having being able to pick where a warband shows up, even though it's only one, is still really useful. Especially if you're going to be doing builds like where you have Saruman or something like that in it, where you don't want your big hero or your leader to be isolated. Like you're guaranteed to have Lurks show up wherever you need him to, and like back up whatever you want him to. So if we're going to invoke the guest rule that we had with Jacob, where Don's <laughs> vote counts as two. <laughs> uh, I'm I'm thinking more top of fortitude, so this might be a three to two vote. Well, uh, um, I saved that part because I just withdrew my vote, so we'll we'll just do the uh, the two to one. We'll give it to Don and Ian. Okay. Yes, Lurtz. <laughs> <laughs> he clawed his way up to the bottom of Valor. You see, <laughs> that's what a utility hero does. I mean. It- uh, to the other guy's point, like I, I do say he is good because he has utility, but Isengard is like they don't have any big heroes besides like Lurts, but they are flush with options for like marching and striking heroes. And I think that's kind of why he gets dragged down a bit. But I still think the, the base profile is really solid. Fair enough. Yeah. Hey, he's a mid tier hero. You can't you can't deny it. So he's 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 definitely not going to be legend. He's he's going to be somewhere where we've got him or in fortitude. So I just want to fight for Lurtz's stock because I like him. Okay. Next we have another captain, and it is Maher. Love the move eight. Love the three attacks. And if we're talking utility, he definitely has his role. And I see him probably. Arguably the most out of these Urukai captains. Um, you know, if you don't want to go war riders or the Dunlin cavalry, which is not the best value in Isengard, um, you know, the nice the one of the coolest things about Isengard is you can just take him in a warband of um Malher scouts. That's your like cavalry in a sense, right? Your objective takers and for a really good price too. So yeah, I really rate them. I don't rate him quite that high. I, I think we're going to have a crowd of uh, uh, heroes in the in the fortitude uh, slot in in this list, and he's one of them. He definitely cracks my uh, micro warband, uh, where I play with 
six heroes at 750 points, but he's not in the top few. That's for sure. His rule is good. He's got three attacks, strength five, fight five. He's definitely solid. Um, but yeah, he like, I don't know. I, I don't rate him quite as highly. I don't think as Richard, but I, I do still rate him highly because of his profile is, is good. But um, like I say, I think there's better heroes in the list than him. If he was five more points and had three might, then I think I'd agree with Richard. I would too. Unfortunately, he's just got the two might. And yeah. I, I appreciate that he doesn't have strike, right? Like it makes him more of a unique profile compared to the other ones because you don't want all of your heroes to be the same. But he does get caught out a lot. I still do really like the move eight, though, on a hero like this. Um, it's very good for like rapid flanks and getting around the sides of formations. But if a hero comes anywhere close to him, he he gets scared very very quickly. Yeah, he's he's um he's a movement guy, right? He's he's got march and he's he's got move eight and he brings a brings guys that have move eight with him. But he's only got two might. I would actually rather have uh, him have two attacks and three might. He's definitely an auto take in both of the scout legions because the, one of the main reasons you take either of those scout legions is for the fast moving scouts. So I agree that he's really, really good in, in those two legions. But in the standard Isengard list, you have so many options for, for movement and for mobility, especially with the addition of the Cribane. So he's a combat hero without the heroic strike. So you can't really use him to fight most heroes. In that sense, he's more of just like a troop muncher that can that brings the movement utility. Yeah, he's I definitely got, don't uh, think he's as good in in pure. He, he's got orphan syndrome, or orphan has Malher syndrome. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm trying. To do. <laughs> so I I have a feeling I'm going to be outvoted here, so I'm going to cast my vote first. <laughs> I like him more than Lurts. Okay, now I'm going to mute myself. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, well, he is 30 points cheaper. You can't deny that. I mean, so yeah. That's I probably put him right behind Saruman. If it was me, I would definitely put him in fortitude. I would definitely put him behind Saruman. I would I'd be uh, happy yeah. to put him like somewhere around Saruman, I think. If he's above or below Saruman, it doesn't make that much of a big deal to me. Sorry, Richard. Well, for me, when I when I think about which model would I take, um, Saruman or Mahur, four times out of five, Mahur. So I would probably put him in fortitude and ahead of Saruman. Okay. I guess that's not that far away from Richard's ranking, right? We'll see once we get all the other heroes up there. All right. So on to Vrasku. This is, this is an interesting one. A lot of beginner players probably overrate this profile a little bit because the the double shots on the crossbow can be really really scary with the might points <laughs> but in my experience he suffers the same issues as the regular crossbowman which you know against an experienced player that knows how to kind of move um optimally against the crossbow where you you know you can't move and shoot you can kind of abuse that a little bit to prevent some uh some shooting angles and stuff like that so uh, i mean he's nice with the three might but yeah i think he's he can be overrated a little bit sometimes he's essentially an urukai captain with some stats and special rule adjustments right i do like him again for the same reason i like lurt's utility so that he brings a lot to the table um again i'm not trying to overrate him here but the, the three might, the, the fight five, strength five um, are strong. Uh, the crossbow is strong. The expert shot is strong. The heroic march is strong. And even accuracy, although I know you guys don't rate it highly, is strong for, for this guy. I take him all the time. Uh, he usually cracks my top few heroes for that reason. He's, he's got great utility. The, the way his profile is designed can be a little bit of a trap because... To get the most out of his shooting, you're, you're sitting back, right? And then if you're sitting back, you're not using his strength five. You're not using his three might or and, as well as he could be. Well, uh, on that point, because he has the crossbow, it's not like he can creep up and still make use of his crossbow while like getting in position. 
to to make the most use out of his might. It's like you got you have to leave him there once you sit him down at the front start of the game. He's probably not going to move until halfway through, in which case he ends up like far away from the action. So it really depends on what build you're going for. Like if you're going to build a list with Saruman, I don't think you take Rashku because you're not going to have as many heroes. You're not going to have as much might. You can't afford to have you know three might just sitting at the back, um, not doing a whole lot for you, right? But if you're doing yeah. a build with a bunch of smaller heroes, then he fits in quite nicely because he gives you a very credible shooting threat. I think he goes somewhere in fortitude because not every Isengard player is going to build to win the shoot war. But I think that's when he is a good pick is when you know your enemy is coming to you and he can afford to just stand there until the enemies get up close and then use them for heroic moves and combats. Last edition, when he also had access to strike, he was a yeah. goaded profile. Yeah. <laughs> he was great. Yeah. Now, like, eh. He's fine. Yeah. I'm thinking somewhere in the middle of Fortitude. What do you guys think? I, I would put him middle or maybe a little above middle, but I would definitely take him more commonly than uh, the Captain, Frida, or the Oathmaker. So for me, he would either be in front of or behind Saruman. I would say about the same as Saruman, but probably a little below just because, you know, I like the, the spiciness of what Sarman brings. That's fair. All right, next we have Ugluck. I actually don't know what people think of him these days. I don't see him talked about a lot, but I think he's the best out of these uh, Isengard captains. And, and he is a really cheap Doric Strike. Well, they all have March, so him having March is nothing special. But having a cheap Doric Strike in there is, is good. And I know I compared him to Gorolf earlier. He's like a slightly cheaper version of Gorolf, so I think they have a, like a similar role. He's a really good like mid-tier hero threat because even though he's he's really cheap and he's not considered super threatening, your opponent is always going to have to consider him as a threat because he has the heroic strike. Yeah, I, I agree with you here. I think opposite of Rashku, I think a lot of newer players underrate this guy because he doesn't have the most like gaudy stats like Lurtz. But if you consider his like points value and what he brings, he has all the necessary tools and he's ridiculously cheap. He's got the three might too that Malher doesn't have. So yeah, I agree with you that he's probably better than he's the best out of the named Urukai heroes. And at low points, especially, like surprisingly like a good leader. Like 500 and under, like, you know, if you're not taking Lurts, like this is your guy. The problem I have with this guy because I don't rate him quite as highly as you guys do, but we're talking hairs here, right? We're splitting hairs. He was very, very popular when this edition first came out because of, of Strike and, and what Richard was saying uh, ab about why he's a good buy. I think he is fairly well costed because he's essentially an Urukai scout captain, but with an extra, what's he got? He's got an extra point of might and special rule and he's got strike right so i think he belongs in an orc hoarded isengard list for his special rule and other than that that special rule is pretty much not going to be used but even without the special rule he's probably fairly accurately costed because he's also got strike I just think, like like Richard said, that Gorolf essentially bumped him out of the list for me because it's like, uh, like I'm going to take Gorolf every time over him. For that reason, I think he's definitely in fortitude, but I think I'm maybe a slot or two below what, what you guys think, maybe. Okay. okay. So I was just rereading his special rule, and it specifically says a friendly warrior troop. So technically, he could kill your own troll. <laughs> <laughs> and just be like, look what I did. You look what I can do. Y'all better pass your courage test. Stupid. That's the ultimate flex right there. Imagine you're about to win the game and you're just like, okay, well, I'm gonna just take out my own troll, you know. Power move, man. Power move. <laughs> do that at the start of the game just for intimidation. Win by making your opponent rage quit. That's wild. <laughs> that is wild. <laughs> so I, I think I'm definitely a little, my opinion's a little bit different from, from Don. Uh, Don also rated Lurts higher than I did. Definitely put him above Lurts. 
So I, he would be somewhere here, even though I think he's more of a top of fortitude. I do think he should be around the same level of alerts or slightly higher because personally, I would take him before I take alerts. You're putting value on the fact that he's he costs less, but he comes with the main things that you want, which which are, are still the three might, you know, fight five, strength five, yeah. uh, and strike. So, and like, those are the things I think you're focusing on. And it's for, you know, what is it? 25 points less, you know, and it's a good point. It's a very good point. I just don't like him as much because he's not alerts. <laughs> I think I'm good with him either, like around alerts. I think alerts is probably better than him, but you know, I'll, I'll see that because Lurtz made it up onto the, the list at all. So into Valor. So <laughs> <laughs> Richard, is he better or worse than Lurtz? We can put him. Yeah, we could slot him be slightly behind, I think, because I uh, think the Lurtz being the hero of Valor. OK, next we have uh, the uh, Yurkai Shaman. So I'm I got to run now. You are a coward. I'm gonna throw quickly into our Facebook chat the uh, where I'm gonna put the rest of the heroes quickly here, <laughs> and then I got a boogie. Most of them are gonna be in fortitude. All right. Yeah, or below. <laughs> uh, Don, it was nice to meet you and talk to you briefly. <laughs> yeah, nice to meet you too. Uh, All right. So, you know, since Ian uh, has left and. Even though he's leaving us his uh, his rankings for the rest, because he's not here in person, I think we his vote will just count as half a vote. <laughs> okay. He doesn't have as much uh, power. It, it will only be used as a tiebreaker. Well, I guess we can't have a tiebreaker <laughs> with three, but <laughs> so basically, we're just going to ignore his vote. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so for the Urkai Shaman, I actually don't value him very much because. Uh, Isengard has quite a few better courage options. So you take the Shaman for Fury typically, but mm -hmm. at the at the expense of uh, a hero that has less might. So he only has one might and he can't really fight. So with Berserkers being an option in the list, when you can just throw in, scatter in two or three into your list, and now you also have Husk Girls, which have Bodyguard, and you also have Wild Men for Fearless. I just don't see Shaman as being very efficient and they, they don't provide the utility that Fury usually does. Well said. I agree 100%. And, um, and they're just so much more expensive than the regular other Orc Shamans and stuff like that. Yeah, because you're paying for the, the extra stats. Well, the other, the other part of it too is um, trying to defend the Orc I, Shaman being worth his points and having a place in the army but the 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 flip side of the coin is that's 50 points you're not spending on something else so is that something else better than the shaman and the answer is yes yeah. um, you can definitely find a better buy for 50 points in this list the best i would say situation to use them is in the salt upon helms deep legendary legion because he gets six more uh, slots in his warband so you can go up to 12 mm -hmm. but if you pay 10 more points, you get a Ballista. Yeah. So uh, I, I don't see a reason not to put him in independent, not because he's like an unusable profile, but I just like, I, I'm struggling to find a situation where he would be good. Well, he does have a spear. So that's something. <laughs> <laughs> he can transfix on a five. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't rate him high. Like I would definitely either at like the highest I think I, I would put him would be minor. I would be fine with him in independent just because to me, he just doesn't crack the list. He just doesn't. He just doesn't make it onto the table. I mean, sure, he'd probably be a fun unit to play with in, in some scenarios and stuff. But if you're actually trying to win games, would you would you take him? And I don't think I would take him. Okay. Independent it is. I just want to add in, we're definitely not counting this one, but Ian has submitted his rankings and he somehow mm. says uh, the Shaman is a Valor. <laughs> you serious? Which, you know, oh. I, I, I don't even want to hear his argument and uh, good <laughs> thing he's not here. So he's definitely <laughs> wrong on this one. We'll put him at the top of Independent. <laughs> 
<laughs> I, part of the reason why he he's downgraded is just because they they nerfed Fury, right? So, like, if Fury hadn't have been nerfed the way it was, like, maybe maybe he would be in minor for me. Yeah. So the next one. Urkai captain. Usually we put captains at fortitude, and maybe we should still, but definitely lower than usual because of the list that we're in. Like Isengard is literally the list of named captains with March everywhere, and they're just all around better because they got better rules. So, like, I guess you take them in assault on Helm's Deep, which you know has also come down in prominence due to the nerf but aside from that like you know they don't have too much of a spot so maybe like above dunlending captain i actually would put him behind because dunlending captain you can argue he's the only profile with march in the legion so there's a point in taking him at higher points if you want the march the only thing that urukai captain brings here is the defense seven none of the named urukai captains have defense seven so if you want a more survival mid-tier hero, maybe top of minor or bottom of fortitude. I, that's that's what I was thinking. I, I'd actually place him exactly where Richard had him. Like I'd take him over the Dunlending chieftain simply because, like, we're talking vanilla Isengard here, and this guy this guy has fight five for five more points. He's, he's he does have one less point of will, and he's got a higher defense too. You know, quite honestly, I I don't play with him because there's just better choices to to spend your points on because essentially all of the named heroes are, you know, Urukai mostly Urukai scout captains with some sort of a- upgrade. I will agree that he's good uh for a generic captain. I remember last edition when every hero could strike, there were some people built who were building Isengard with just pure generic captains because they were pretty decent for uh for 65 points so i can yeah. i can see the argument that and, of still using them and if you're gonna go with like a mass crossbow shooting force like you can arm him with a traditional crossbow like after rasku so there's some mm-hmm. flexibility there yeah i mean yeah. truth be told if you took out all of the named urukai heroes you could still have a good army using Urukai captain. So he's he's definitely like a good captain profile. Just I don't play with him that much because like the the named heroes are just a better buy. Yeah. Uh, next we have the Urukai scout captain. So this one you would realistically only see in in the two legions, right? In in a Glug scout and Lurta scouts. Like I I don't see a reason why you would take in regular when. You, you, you could just take the generic captain if you had to. This list has a lot of this kind of thing going on in it with their units. Like they're all based around a profile and then their points go up and their stats go up or their points go down and their stats go down. So it's like, yeah, you can take this captain for like five points less, but then you get one less point of defense. You know, slight changes in weapon options as well, but... There's a lot of that going on in, in this faction. If you rate, you know, saving five points and lowering your defense as, as being good, then maybe that would count for something. But to me, uh, yeah, he's just an Urukai captain that's not quite as good. Yeah, totally agree here. So right next to him or below the Dunland? I'd put him below, be... below the Dunland. So below, I... Yeah, because yeah. he he doesn't bring anything new in the legion, right? Uh, yeah. Other no. than warband slots. Yeah, because at least uh, the Dunlin captain brings march. Yep. Okay. I, I maybe even argue him in minor because just because his role is so small in Isengard, like when do you really see this guy? Like not necessarily like being bad, just but just like when was the last time you saw a Urukai scout captain? The only time you see him, usually, at least the only time I see him or actually use him is to use my Urukai scout captain model with a two-handed weapon, <laughs> right? So then you see him occasionally. Yeah, that's fair. All right, the drummer. I mean, you see him in Lurch's Scouts. Yeah, th- this one. this one's a little tricky because... He, he's like super valuable in, in Lurtz's of Scouts. And, you know, you, you, pretty much you don't see a Lurtz of Scouts army that doesn't have a drummer in it. But just talking vanilla Isengard, he still does what he's there for, right? And increases the movement of your troops. 
the, the thing is, we see we see Isengard with mixed keywords nowadays, right? We see orcs mm -hmm. in there, we see Dunland in there. So the drum only buffs or irks. So unless you're taking like a pipe block or or scouts, I don't see it being as good as like say the orc drummer in Mordor. Like he's almost sort of niche because you you kind of have to build your army around having him. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like the typical army that I play with in Urukai has a little bit of everything. It's got Dunlins, it's got orcs, it's got Urukai. You know, yeah. it's it's got everything, and he just doesn't do well in an army like that because, it's like you said, you kind of have to have an army that's almost all Urukai keyword. And, you know, if you're going to take him, you're probably also taking Maher and maxing out his warband on Marauder scouts. Yeah. And if, if you're not going to go like super like crazy movement buff stacks and you just need like a slight boost, there's so much heroic march in this list that I don't think it's really necessary. It's a nice to have option, but somewhere fortitude, maybe like the lower end. Yeah. I'm okay with. Yeah. Also, having a small hero like this brings uh, weaknesses in scenarios like Fog of War and Assassination because yep. he is a hero uh, and and he can be pretty easy to, to take down. So I'll, I'll put him here because he has the same role as a Dunlin Chieftain, but mm. I see you, you probably see him more in pure than, than a Dunlin Chieftain. Yeah, I'm good with I that. Think th I think that's fair. Okay, next we have Sharku. He has his own Legion. Don't forget that. <laughs> he could be, be a budget Ellen Dill. Wait, that's quite a stretch. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, his fight four, I think, really brings him down. I mean, and, he I mean, is a hero, and he's on a mount, and he's got strength four and three might. So, mm -hmm. like, that does count for something in, in this very cavalry poor list. In that sense, he's good. Um, but, yeah, his profile... Again, comparing it to the other heroes in the list, he's he's just falling short. I think I would put him between Frida and the Urukai captain. Yeah, I mean, he does bring you a mounted option. Uh, if you're not taking Thryden and you want a hero that can knock down, and his special uh, knife where he can deal damage back at an enemy, I've seen it wound a, a big hero before. So it's it can surprise you once in a while. It's not reliable by any means, but... It, it can it can do cool things once in a while. It's just the fight for is just a little uh, kind of underwhelming, right? Yeah, like I do play with this guy quite a bit, in spite of my kind of like poor review of him. But I I do like him. It just because he's a mounted hero, and when playing Urukai, like the focus of your attention on your opponent is is their mounted heroes. Probably why I, I slightly rate Vrasku a little bit higher than you guys, because, you know, shooting out a horse is is the main way you deal with that. Counter charging with your own cavalry is another way that you can at least temporarily deal with with that kind of a mm -hmm. threat. But yeah, it is just his profile is just underwhelming, I would say. Right. Okay, now we have the orc captain. You know, sometimes I forget this profile is in Isengard. <laughs> mm -hmm. First of all, the reason you would take him is what, uh, I don't know. I guess if you're playing Uglock Scouts in a pure list, I don't know if I would take him. If you want a Might Battery, both Maker is better. And if you want a, a Mounted Hero, Sharku and Thryden, you have options. So I don't yeah. know if there's much of a point in taking him. It, it never cuts the list, honestly, because again, you would just take Sharku and like it, like maybe you've already taken Sharku and you're going to consider taking Orc Captain, but why would you do that? Yeah, I agree. It, it, in Isengard, it's just, it, it, it he doesn't fit. And I think that maybe pushes him in like a minor or even top of independent, who knows? Well, and we, we haven't talked about it yet. We talked a bit about keyword, but like his, his keyword doesn't it's not in sync with the army bonus yeah right mm -hmm. so so he's losing that as well yeah it's it's an interesting profile we ranked him really high in angmar and for good reason but even though it's the same profile it's just like it doesn't bring anything into the list mm -hmm. maybe so minor I, then <laughs> i guess if you take him it's not like you're making your list uh terrible by any means it's just 
everything else above is better. So yeah, yeah, I'm good with minor. Yeah. I'm good with that okay. spot. Okay, now we're on to the warriors. So we have the basic Urkai warrior. You guys know that there has been a recent increase in fight five armies the last few years. And uh, there, th this used to be a really good, really solid profile, I found. Um, but these days, I just don't think Fight 4 is as good as it used to be. I don't think it's as amazing. And, and, and maybe that's why I haven't played this army as much in the last few years. And I would agree with that. I think a lot of people always still quote that, like, you know, he has, like, the holy trinity of stats of the Fight 4, Strength 4, D6. But maybe it's power creep, but all those stats are like, and now the strength four is nice. But then the D6 even now is not amazing. There's so many D7s, so many fight fives. And yeah, I think it's it's just literally average now, especially if you take in the points cost. Because I think in the competitive scene, if like if it's legend or valor tier, then I think it would be allied in a lot more and you almost never see Urukai allied anywhere. They're, they're just yeah. not quite there. But of course, if you play Isengard as a peer list, you're going to take them. So I think that's the definition of fortitude for me. If you compare him with the stats of a Miranda orc, you are paying a point for his courage. So paying for courage three is makes, makes them just inefficient when you're spamming them because they, they have models that can mitigate courage. Defense six is also not as good as it is before because we have more strength four as well, more uh, troops with wounding bonuses. So D six is not as uh, solid as it used to be, where more than half the armies used to be strength three. So if you faced Urkai, you're like, oh man, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to wound them all in sixes. It's mm -hmm. not the case anymore. So their support option pikes also lacks the ability to take a shield, which yeah. uh, adds a weakness in your battle line, right? It's a shame that they they uh, they don't improve Urukai with Pike because there's like it's part of the plastic kit. Like you, you get so many of those models around, and all of all they've done is make Pikes worse by penalizing taking a Pike and a crossbow. So a, a Pike crossbow armed Urukai used to be amazing. Um, and now you like never see it because they uh, are minus one on their duel. I think it is. So it's a shame that they aren't better with pikes. But I do agree with all that you guys have said. Yeah, the holy trinity of like fight for strength for defense six was last edition. This is the current edition, and it's no longer the holy trinity. <laughs> Where would you guys say it is on the four two tier? I think they still have really good things going for them, like your crossbow. I think you would still take it if you're going to take this army. Pikes are still, I would say, good. It's, you're still having strength for support, which is the only way to get it in this list. So it's, I, it's, it's hard to compare with like heroes sometimes, but I would just say top of fortitude because yeah. you do you do see it as you know the the Urukai army still quite often, and it's still a very viable build if you want to go pure Urukai, you know, Isengard force. Yeah. Yeah. E cool. Even, even the most diverse are sort of, you know, odd Urukai construction that you can come up with will still usually include some Urukai warriors. So, you know, and some, you still see entire armies of, of Urukai warriors, not that it's particularly competitive, but I think, I think they're definitely fortitude and yeah, it's hard to compare them to warriors, but they're, they're in virtually like 90% of Urukai builds. So that says something. Yeah, yeah, for sure. All right, now the Urukai Scout. I think this one, I would just slot below Malher. You usually take them with Malher without like the uh, movement bonuses. I, I don't think they're, they're usually worth it. And like Don said earlier, they're kind of like valued similarly to the Urukai Warrior. It's just like you're losing like a defense... And then it's just like trading um, stats for points. Um, generally not as good as the Urukai Warrior, but, you know, if you get the move eight, then they're solid. Yeah. And I believe they have Woodland Creature. Yep. That's also pretty nice. And um, access to the strength three bows and being able to move half when you're, when you're stacking movement bonuses on them. 
uh, it can be really annoying to face. Yeah, I, I would probably still rate them in fortitude, but higher in the Legion. But outside the Legion, I, th I think I agree where, where we have them there. Okay. Now we have the Berserker. Mm-hmm. So I was a little bit disappointed when the edition first came out because they nerfed Berserker's defense. Mm -hmm. And also the Berserker blade isn't as good as it sounds on, on paper. But I do like to include some in my lists just for their high courage. I think that's pretty good. And, and I think it's still worth it, even though they are quite expensive. The unfortunate drop in, in defense was kind of a kick in the junk for them. I still do take them also because, uh, again, this is, is a list that is almost devoid of cavalry. So when your heroes are charging, they don't get cavalry bonuses. So normally the way I play is these guys are companion models to heroes that will, will help you ensure uh, winning a dual role when you're about to do uh, heroic combat. So like you can heroic combat with a berserker, a hero and, and maybe a spear or pike support. And almost with the plus two attacks from the berserker, you're almost guaranteed to win the duel. And then, you know, those, those two models can go into other combat. So for those reasons, I normally will always uh, take a few of these models in my list, but like you just don't see these guys spammed anymore like you like you used to see because the the difference in in their stat profile is basically you know the these guys essentially have defense 6 until they make it into combat with the impervious to bow fire and then once they make it into combat they die because they have defense 5 yeah yeah i, I think i agree with everything but you know, I, I think maybe it's a good change, you know, um, something that isn't crazy efficient, like an elite mm. uh, warrior that you can spam, but you always recommend taking a few. I don't know, maybe either like above or below Malher level, since you're going to probably see them sprinkled in in most Isengard armies. For me, I would probably put them just behind the warrior and ahead of Maher. Okay. That's where I would put it, but... Yep, that sounds good to me. Next, we have the very similar, but maybe not as good, Feral Urukai. Mm. That's not a maybe. Oh. <laughs> yeah, <that's> <laughs> def <laughs> there's definitely no maybe there. <laughs> this is one of the profiles that was really good last edition, but yeah. they got se severely nerfed in this edition, where if you compare the stats with, in, with a Berserker, it's there's almost no reason to take him. This uh, is a model that's definitely in need of a, an FAQ upgrade. Like Games Workshop invented this profile and then they beheaded the profile. Um, like, honestly, yeah. it's one of the worst double whammy nerfs that we've seen in the game. Taking a model that was a popular model and now you literally never see it on the table. Like, you know, basically they, they removed a point of defense and also increased the cost. If they had have only done one of those, you probably still wouldn't see it. <laughs> Definitely bottom of the list for me. I got maybe like six to eight unpainted, you know, ready for the rules change. Once that, who knows, if it does ever take into yeah. effect, then uh, I'll definitely be painting those this is, up. This is one of these situations where, I, like, I wish we would see, uh, like, we're not seeing anything right now from Games Workshop, sadly. But, I, like, I wish we would see a little bit more creativity in the in the FAQ and the addendums. Because, you know, we've talked about two mo models in, in this faction that are considered very poor in the Shaman and and the, the Feral. What would happen if you gave the Feral a special rule where if it's under the influence of a Fury spell, like, Fury works better for this model? That'd right? be great. Like, That'd be like awesome. some, something like that. So then it's like, okay, that one rule makes now both of these units better and like yeah. in combination with each other. So like, I wish we would see more things like that from, from the rules designers. Um, maybe we will in the future. That's, that's a I, really cool idea. No wonder you're yeah. the creative guy on North of the Shire. <laughs> <laughs> I, I also think uh, since Games Workshop designed it to be like a scout version of the Berserker, yeah. If it was the Lurch of Scouts, that would, that would make them unique as well. Yep, absolutely. It, it's it's kind of missing from that list, in my opinion, as well. Yeah. So yeah. does it go above or below the Shaman? The very bottom. The very Sadly, bottom. yes. 
All right. We have the Isengard troll next. For viewers of this podcast, you know how we generally feel about uh, the troll profiles. Other than like beginners maybe bringing it to their first tournament or a war like introduction games, I don't see this profile at all. So do you guys see any competitive viability? Sadly, no. Unfortunately, like basically what you get is is kind of an ordinary unit, which is has just a massive base that costs 110 points. So, I mean, if it had a base the size of a cave troll, maybe it would be better. I mean, about the only thing that I've found that these guys are decent at is shielding against heroes. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, because yeah, because that you know you're throwing out six attacks at fight seven. So you know, with any luck, you can win fights and and stop a hero from doing anything for a turn or two. But yeah, generally, it's it's just too many points uh, for what you're getting, and yeah. with the base size that big, it gets swarmed all the time, and you know, you just never see it do much. He costs more than all the heroes in the list are than Saruman. Yeah, he's like a warband of Urukai too. So, yeah, I think I think the real argument is who's worse, him or the Mordor troll. So, you know, I think he's definitely in the dumps for me. You know, a lot of newer players will be drawn to him as like the monster in this list, but unfortunately, mm -hmm. he's just he's not there. So, yeah, there's some like cool tricks you might be able to do with Sorceress Blast, blasting models into his combat, but. Yeah, that's that's purely for fun. Even if they lowered his points, like if you, I, I haven't compared the stats for a cave troll versus this guy, but you know what's a cave troll? Seventy five, I think. So, like, I mean, if you move this guy to say ninety points, like, would would that mean that you would take it? And I don't know that you would still. Okay, that's just sad. <laughs> yeah, that's that's you know? brutal. That's that says a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So I actually think he goes below the ferals because if I see an enemy with eyes and control this, I would be like, yes. But if I see like a few ferals, you know, maybe those ferals will actually do something and, and he's only taking a few. So maybe they're not down that, that much. Like if you're playing an enemy that doesn't have shooting, they're, they're suddenly a little bit better, right? Yeah. Ferals. Um, just like, because like I, I play a lot of Kazadum, right? And, yeah. and it's, it's the same thing that your, your iron guards suffer from. So like, say you have four iron guard in your army. Well, they just get shot out before you even get into combat because everyone targets them. Right. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm okay with this. I, I would probably just put him above the ferals just, just because like he, he is still a monster and, you know, people can still walk into him. He can get some dice rolls and take down a hero or hurls and stuff like that. But if both of you want it below the ferals, then I'm okay with that too. Same thing. <laughs> the brutal power attacks are, are a good call out because, you know, a lucky hurl or a, like a well-planned hurl can, can win you a lot of points. But yeah, e either spot. I'm fine with either spot, honestly. Well, I'm, I'm not going to defend the ferals, so... <laughs> Okay. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so I'm, I'm okay with this. We have next the Dunlending Warrior. I actually think that these guys are a little bit underrated. I know when people think Isengard, they think Urukai spam, uh, but uh, the they still have the strength four. They have the piercing strike, which the Urukai don't have. So the possibility of going up to strength five for a pretty cheap warrior isn't bad. I actually use these guys in my list all the time. Part of the reason is because I also play with Frida all the time. And so Frida has, has a special rule that keys off of these guys and allows them, I believe it's reroll wounds against horses, which can be really handy for a strength four model. So you're essentially giving yourself a 75% chance of killing a horse. Uh, with a reroll. Also, these guys can take bows, so I, I tend to include them in my in my army as as archers. I, I don't think they're quite as good as the Urukai warrior, um, so I put them below. If it was me, I would probably put them between Urukai warrior and berserker, simply because 
I include more of these guys in my list than I do include berserkers. And they do have some versatility in, in the way that you can take them. They can take a banner. You can take a two-handed axe, but unfortunately, you would almost never take a guy, one of these guys with a two-handed axe now that you have Huskerls in the list. So, mm -hmm. All right. So, yeah. So the next one we'll, we're going to be talking about is the Huskerl. So I think at face value, they're a little bit overpriced because of their conditional fight for. And compared to the regular warrior and what they get in addition... Uh, it's not worth like the five, four or five points more. I assume it's be because it's designed for the Legion where they want you to pay like a like a premium for supports because it's not a list that's yeah. supposed to have a traditional battle line. Um, in standard Isengard, I, I guess it makes sense because they don't want it to take over the role of the pikemen because if they were only like nine points, it would there would be no reason to take um, Eric Pikemen. So yep. I actually think they're okay, but definitely not as good in pure Isengard. It's a weird profile, honestly. I, I I just think there's too much going on in this profile with his stats and points and special rules. And they just don't all add up to like a really cost effective unit because it's like you have a, you have a unit that is bodyguard but is designed to fight in the second rank. Yeah. And you're paying a lot of points for essentially like a fight three model that under certain specific circumstances can get to fight four. I think if they just made him fight four and got rid of his favor of the war chief rule, he'd be a really good unit. But the way it is right now, it's just like I do play with them, but like they don't crack my vanilla Isengard list. I play with them in the Dunlin Legion because you kind of need them there. I'm not even sure I would and put these guys in fortitude for me in vanilla isengard maybe bottom of fortitude then just because of the spot in the legion yeah that it has okay but i, I do think they're really good in the legion although we're not talking about battle companies here they are actually like the <laughs> dunlin got a new battle company and these are an important unit for for battle companies because they they unlock heavy armor for your army so i think we could put it above the the war chief or the Chieftain? Chieftain, yeah. All right. Next, we have the Wild Men of Dunland. These guys used to be a meme, but mm. <laughs> with the new rules, they, they have a special rule now with the Oathmaker. They provide a very cheap option for Fearless and also to bulk up your models. If you want to just take an extra warband of them and hide them behind their lines, they, they make you even harder to break than before. The fact that you can get Fearless and the Oathmaker being much better than the Shaman, that's an alternative to the Berserker. And definitely, like, you're going to see a lot of them in the Legion. So I'd probably put them above the Oathmaker. I actually don't think I rate these guys as high as you, mainly because I don't rate the Oathmaker as high as you guys do. I do see the benefit of it, the Fearless, etc. But to me, they're the same cost as an Orc, Okay. And an orc has just got way more utility than this guy has in your army. And yes, you do have to pay points for it. But like an orc with a spear and a shield for seven points, to me, is better than, than uh, a wildman of Dunland, Oathmaker or no Oathmaker. But <laughs> I get your point. Their stat line is pretty bad. Like you're paying for the Courage 3 and that's why they, they have the Defense 3 compared to the Orcs Defense 4. So yeah, I think Orc Warriors are a better profile. If you do take the Orc Maker though, you're you're definitely taking Wild Man of Dunlin. So I'm I'm yeah. cool with it like just behind. I, I think I think it's hand in hand. Like if you're if you're taking Wild Men of Dunland, you're taking the Oath Maker. And if you're taking the Oath yeah. Maker, you're taking Wild Men of Dunlin, right? It's a, yeah. they they're kind of like the Kind of like the Maher and the Marauder Scouts is is kind of like the Oathmaker and the Wildman of Dunlap Absolutely. Kind of relationship. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I'm good with that. Okay. Next, we have the Dunland uh, Horsemen. Dunlanding Horsemen. So just a frame of reference, a really similar profile to the Wargrider. I think they have the same uh, cost as well. The difference is like the slight bonus against horses, enemy horses, yeah. and uh, they do have the Courage 3. They do. Yeah. A war gear is a little bit different. A very similar profile. If you do want Cav in the list, it's it's like a personal preference because they're they're so similar, right? So yeah. I you know, wherever the war rider ends up, I think that's where the Dunlending horseman ends up. 
I definitely think um, the war grider is higher, even if it's by a couple spots, honestly, just because of the warg shenanigans that you can do. It's sticking around for hero combats, the dismounting for objectives. I don't know. I personally just, compared to a regular horse, I tend to favor the war riders quite a bit more, even if the stat lines are similar. So, I, I mean, I think this cavalry profile is fine, but um, we'll get to the war rider later. And, and, but I, I rate them quite a bit more. Yeah. I, I'm right in there with, with what you, you, you guys have said. And uh, I agree with Richard in that, like, I, I think that the war rider sort of pips this guy to the post just barely simply because the war can always stick around. Right. And it's still a strength four model. So, you know, they're very close, but yeah, I, I think, I think for me, the war rider just bumps them out. And like, I normally in vanilla Isengard, I'm using war riders and in the Legion, of course, you're using these models here. Where would you put them, Charles? I was thinking maybe the closer to the bottom of uh, Fortitude, but... Yeah, I'm okay with that. I think I'm okay. Maybe like here. Here. Yeah. Definitely better than the Husk Girls. Yeah. That poor Dunlin Chieftain just keeps getting pushed further and further down the ladder. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, to be fair, outside of the Legion, you're probably not taking him very often. He he yeah. looks so much better at the beginning of the video when there was only a couple fortitude. Yeah, he was look he was looking strong. <laughs> yeah, I guess the trend we're seeing is that Isengard has a lot of playable models, but are not necessarily optimized. So they have a lot of decent choices, right? Yeah, it's just like I said earlier on. We're we're going to be crowding out the fortitude slot here with this faction. <laughs> we have the Cribane next. This one is not fortitude, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I think this one is probably the best model in the list. Um, you know, you can argue that Grima has better function, but, you know, having to guess Armin as well is a huge hurdle. <laughs> Cribane, you just throw in, you know, yeah. and, and when you do ally in Isengard in those rare occasions you know you're going to be throwing one or two Kerbane in there at least. Yeah. yeah. I believe it's the cheapest flyer in the game. Ridiculous. The introduction of this one unit made Isengard as a faction more competitive. It gave them something they, they didn't have, and that was, you know, okay, you can make an argument they had mobility with, you know, Marauder Scouts and Warg Riders, etc. But, like, this is a model that can win games. Yeah, dude, you can threaten enemy spear supports. You can mm -hmm. grab objectives. They can tank as well because of their multiple wounds, their extra rule against shooting. And that arguably is like makes them a better objective takers than the more expensive flyer models like the Bat Swarm. Being able to shoot at it because that's one of the biggest weaknesses of the Bat Swarm. They're even infantry, so they can you know they can dig up. Uh, yeah. Your, your heirloom or whatever, like that kind of thing. So yeah. Yeah. if you want to be a little cheesier, they can also carry the demolition charge. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so next we have the Orc Warrior. So we talked a little bit about it when we were going over the Wild Men. They're just a generally a really solid profile. Now in Isengard, maybe not um, since, since there's, they don't have as much sort of a synergy Especially like get with the uh, army bonus, they they don't have the Isengard uh, keyword. So, you know, they're a solid profile. Um, you, sometimes you'll want to take some to spam out numbers. Maybe you don't want to pay pay so many points for a Pike or a Huskerl. Then you take some Orc Spearmen for cheap support. So there there is a role in here. What do you guys think? I personally think that the Orc profile is better in a vacuum than the Urukai Warrior. But like you said, in this particular list, the, the army bonuses, like the drum and like certain synergies probably work a little bit better with the Urukai Warriors. So I would probably slot them a little below. I know, I know, Don, you play more with the Urukai Warrior like lists, but I think when I play Isengard, I, you know, I tend to lean towards more the orcs and the numbers. So I pro probably put them right behind the Urukai Warrior here. I think an orc with a spear and a shield has a real place in, in this list. And it actually synergizes 
very well with an Urukai warrior with shield. And it does the same job as an Urukai warrior with pike, but is actually better because it's it's cheaper and it has a shield. So when your front line disintegrates, you can still like shield with your orc with a spear and a shield. So for se seven points, like he definitely has a spot in this list, but it's again, it's kind of niche. Yeah, agreed. Okay, um, Warg Rider. So we, we talked a little bit about it when we were going over the Dunlanding Horsemen. So it seems like the consensus is that it's slightly better than the Horsemen. Now, would you guys just put him right above it or several slots up? I think personally, it, he's probably higher just because he has the flexibility to go with like an Isengard Urk spam or an Orc spam. Like you're going to take take the war rider in most lists to get like a bit more yeah. flexibility like i know the crabane is good but um they they are still a little bit pricier and a cav in a way is anti-cav as well you know don has talked about the weakness of isengard being cavalry or more specifically probably mounted heroes so yeah. war riders nullify that a little bit more so probably put it around like where the berserker is maybe even a little higher pre crabane you yeah. would always see, you know, three to five war riders in in a competitive Arden Isengard list, and even after Krabin, you still see a few of them in the list. And like I still always use them, just for all the reasons that we've talked about. Um, and you don't really have a lot of other choices for cavalry, so you know it's kind of this or the the, the Dunlanding cavalry model. Mm -hmm. It sounds like I'm worth with Richard on this. Okay. up in this area where you've got them now maybe above the dumb maybe even above the orc warrior because you see them in multiple builds and um i don't know i think that's like definitely the top of fortitude for me plus if you were playing wolves of isengard you're well there you, go. <laughs> there you go okay so we have our first siege weapon we have the demolition team we know that this has been nerfed <laughs> Uh, in the Legion, but um, you do still see it. Well, you do, do still see it in the Legion, but outside the Legion, occasionally, you would still see the bomb. Definitely a very scary and fun option. It's, it's always a weird one to rank because it's like an auto-take in the Legion, but then outside Legion, it's kind of a meme. It doesn't help that the, the Legion is no longer at like the top tier anymore. <laughs> I think pre-nerf, I would probably put it in like High Valor, but I think post-nerf, probably somewhere in the upper half of fortitude yeah it's not even just that the bomb itself was nerfed but also because the legion is a lot less popular than it used to be you're, you're gonna just see this profile less overall yeah and i i gotta confess that this is probably the model in this list that i have the least experience with i have played with it but on rare occasion and like i tend to play mostly vanilla urukai um or isengard rather and like i don't i don't like this model simply because i'm old and i struggle to remember complicated rules so any model that has more than a page of rules attached to it i generally try to avoid it so this model has a page of rules attached to it with numerous faq adjustments and like i just don't want to be bothered with that when i'm playing and i like i know in in vanilla isengard this is not exceptionally effective so yeah again i i would rather just take stuff that is going to be as effective or more effective and easier to understand and play with yeah. some people like to keep it simple so this profile is really good in the legion because you don't have access to heroic strike so it threatens mm. big heroes it can delete them off the board instantly in yeah. Vanilla Isengard, you have Hero Strike, you have uh, tools to deal with big heroes. So it's almost like one of your one of the options in your toolkit. But you can play against heroes in so many other ways. You can counter heroes in with other other heroes that you have in the list. So I don't really see it as like a necessary profile at all. So I'm actually thinking more like bottom of Fortitude, even high minor. I actually don't think that it's a very easy uh, profile to use, but where did you say, Richard? Where did you have it? Middle of Fortitude, just because mm -hmm. I think 
a saw on Helm's Deep is probably still more competitive than the Dunlin Legion. And I think most assault lists will still take this. So I would just rank it okay. probably slightly above mo- most of the Dunlin profiles we have at the bottom of Fortitude. Hey, there. let's see. What does Ian have to say about this one? He only talked about the, the heroes. <laughs> oh, Ian, we're so disappointed. What about like right here? Sure. I know I know Don likes Frida, so maybe let's put it below Frida. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Above Shark. Put, put Frida actually more that way. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, the second siege weapon we have is the assault ballista. Mm. Another siege weapon that was nerfed in the Legion uh, multiple times. Yeah. Uh, it now has a minimum range, and the scatter and the reroll is now only rerolls of one. So a lot less efficient than it used to be. I do think that it's still good in pure and would occasionally take one. What do you guys think when you can get shooting from other places like Rasku and crossbow spam and stuff like that? Well, it's just a cheap um, siege weapon and you can't discount that. I mean, I personally hate playing with and against siege weapons in MESBG, but like as an option, I can't deny that it's good, you know? (laughs) And like, even with the nerf, I don't think assault is bad. I think it still has a place in the tournament scene. And it's because of this model. It's not because of the bomb. It's not because of the super jacked leader Urukai captain. But yeah. it's it's because of this model. And there's a reason why it took so many nerfs. So I think this one has to be like Valor for me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Before you nerfed, it was Legend easily. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm with, like, I agree with your description 100%, Richard, in this and in, in that, like, I think it's good because of its point value. I agree. I can't stand siege weapons either playing with them or against them in, in what's supposed to be a skirmish game. But, you know, they're here, so we got to deal with it. To me, the, this weapon, which I do play with the odd time, its effectiveness is in in its influence on your opponent rather than the actual damage it does. So in my experience, it's the same with this as with the Dwarf Ballista. Both are cheap. Both are not fantastic siege weapons, but both are direct fire weapons. And essentially, uh, your opponents get afraid of them. And you can lock out parts of the board with this. It probably won't make back its point value in the game, but you can like shut down parts of the board with it, which is very effective and handy. Yeah. Oh, a hundred percent. But I would push back a little bit in the case of the Legion. I think it does often make up your points. You know, when you come up against like a, a smaller hero with like one or zero fate, like a Bormir of Gondor or a Golovar, mm-hmm. you know, I've seen too many times where uh, a hero like that, which is easily often more worth more than the ballista or two, yeah. they go down, especially with like the extra might point on on the ballista. And yeah, it's it, it can definitely win you games in that sense. Well, it's got it does have a shoot four, right? So with the shoot four and and one point of might available, you can you can definitely get lucky with with a shot and hit a big target i just never have but <laughs> it, it, it is possible i suppose for, for me i think i'm sitting around the middle of valor possibly higher end of valor would probably be above thriden for me don if you're okay with that i'm okay with it i like again it's one of the models in the list that i don't play with a lot simply because i don't like siege engines but i can't <laughs> deny that it's a good unit you're an honorable man I respect that. <laughs> okay, so that, there's actually one profile that we, we we missed, and I just realized while we were tearing. It is Snaga, the or captain that mm. we got in Warren Rohan. So usually you would see him in Uglug Scouts, but he is technically in the Isengard army list. And uh, yeah, so he's like a three three might or captain at 50 points. And what he does is he has a special rule where he can choose to he can choose to not take part in a heroic move during like a with me and he can choose to move after. I know, I know when he first came out, a lot of like the community was like, 
theory crafting. What can we do with this crazy rule? Like, I'll admit, it's a really <laughs> fun rule. And like, I guess you can think of uses for it. But the thing is that I think people figured out that the the fringe uses aren't even that good. So like <laughs> you can you can try very hard to pull pull something off, but it's not gonna be hugely beneficial. So I think maybe so it, I, I don't have his profile in front of me. Is he is he fight for defense for what, what D5? Is he? D5? Yeah, fight for D5. Uh the only act, heroic action he has is challenge. So very limited. Mm. And uh, he has a special rule where he can only lead orcs. So in a pure Isengard list, that really limits what he can do. So three might for 50 points, that's good. That's yep. almost on the level of the Oathmaker. Um, but other than bringing in Might, if you don't use his uh, Cunning Mind special rule where you could delay your hero move, uh, he doesn't really offer much else on top of that. So is he better or worse than Sharku? Because he's also an orc. Sharku can be mounted and... So I would, uh, Charku, I would. Put... Charku has heroic strike too, does he not? No, no, he has march. March, okay. Well, that makes him better than a regular captain. I I think Snago without the march is lower. I I would probably say like even bottom of minor because I probably take a regular orc captain in front of him. I would agree with that bottom of minor. I'm good with that. Okay. Well, this has been our Isengard tier list. And once again, thank you to Don for coming on to the show uh, to help us uh, rate one of his favorite armies in the game. Thank Thanks for, for having watching. me on, guys. Appreciate it. Yeah, anytime. Thank you all for watching and look forward to the next episode of Into the West podcast.